Welcome everyone, it's lovely to see you. It is so good to be here. And to resume what has become our February tradition to present a Black History program with our own local hero and poet, <laughs> Jelly. And he's here tonight and he does have a brand new book of poetry out, which you will hear tonight and which he has also graciously donated two copies to the library. So um, he'll be able, they're both checked out. He just donated them last week and they're already checked out, but uh, you can put your name on a reserve list and he'll have other um, ways for you to obtain such a wonderful book. And now it's sliding down. And so uh, many of you know our speaker, formerly William Forshawn, and now known as Jelly, so let's have a big hand. And All righty, thank you for being here. We may need to change check volumes there. Uh, hopefully the sound is not too hot for you, and I'm glad that you can all make it out tonight. Uh, as you, if you know me, you know the name that my parents gave me, William Dandridge Pickett Fortune, the fourth. <laughs> and I stand before you as Jelly. Um, the name Jelly comes from from West Africa and the Ghanaian tradition, a jelly is a storyteller. Before there was the griot, which was the name given to this by the, the colonize, colonizers, the French, there was the jelly. But the jelly was more than a storyteller. The jelly was a lifeblood. The jelly was a wisdom keeper, a culture bearer. The jelly was a healer, the jelly was a priest, a, a shaman. And in my lifetime, I've wondered why I've done all the various things I've done until I was introduced to the jelly. And all of a sudden, things seemed to co coalesce. And that which I knew from when I was a child woke up and was allowed to be. And so I stand before you today as Jelly. As we gather here, I would also like to uh, appreciate the four winds that have brought you here. I've come from the east, the west, the north, and the south. Uh, I would like to thank, with such gratitude, the ancestors that inspired you to show up, to question, to wonder, to be curious, to be here. And I would also like to show gratitude and thanks for you. Your outward world in which we see every day, your inner world, which also adds to your curiosity, that curiosity that gets you here that curiosity that moves you lovingly through our community. <coughs> and I also want to recognize the ancestors, all of your ancestors and all of my ancestors. Uh, as we arrive here in celebration of black history, often there's a lot of, of talking about the struggle and the strife and often we forget that none of us would be here without love. None of us. No matter how difficult your life was or is, there was someone who cared, someone who lovingly stepped in to stop someone from doing something that was hurtful, someone who lovingly offered you nourishment and support and a place to sleep. And to them, I say thank you. And I also want to give gratitude to Star. 
and the library staff for having me here yet again. Uh, it is really important to be in community with you. Uh, as I awaken to my space and my place as jelly, it is such a breath of life to be in community with you. I also want to thank the Arts Council of Wyndham County who offered me a grant this year to encourage my creativity and growth. The Vermont Arts Council, Farnham Insulators, who also sponsored me in creation. Uh, the National Endowment for the Arts, Clemens Family Farm of Charlotte, Vermont, who continue to support my creative endeavors, and National Association of Black Storytellers, who when I showed up calling myself Jelly, they said, yes, you are. And to my family of birth and my family of choice. And I also want a special thanks to someone who's not here in this room because she's at home taking care of kids, our blended family, my wonderful partner, Sarah Dew. So I've told you about where Jelly comes from. And I stand before you a little uh, in a bittersweet moment because this is Black History Month. And the reason it's bittersweet is that I get to be before you. I get to bring alive this history and the history that's being born every day. Um, it's not just 100 years and 400 years and 1,000 years ago. It's today history. And the bittersweet is that it's Black History Month. And there would be no need for a Black History Month if black history was a part of the history we taught every day. And that's, just breathe that in for a moment. If we taught this history every day, it would be our history. So I hope you recognize yourself in black history. And I also stand here because we have this that we talk about in black history. There's the black and there's white. And often we will hear about white supremacy or white superiority, which has a flip side to it. Because if there is white superiority, then there's black inferiority. And that's not often spoken about, except in the terms of racism. And that race, isn't even a thing. We're part of, or all, the human race. Yet, from this thing that isn't a thing, we have racism, which is, yeah, I started real heavy. <laughs> and this is where my book, The Day After Juneteenth, comes in. Uh, this book was written when I started to do performances for Juneteenth celebrations. And I, I wondered what happened the day after the celebrations when you have people who have been enslaved for hundreds of years, for many generations, and each of those generations teaching their families and their children how to be enslaved. What happens when the chains are released? What happens when the fences are opened? Where do you go when you don't have anyone telling you what to do? When you don't have anyone providing a job or a place to live? Often you stay. You continue to do what you've done for generation after generation, year after year. And it hadn't even occurred to me in writing this, um, but I have family members who immediately bought this book and they started reading it. Family groups, my family, would gather together and read a poem at a time and then discuss. And my aunt spoke to me and said, do you know that today is the day after Juneteenth? And I, it hit me that every day that we deal with racism, that we deal with race, that we step into Black History Month, we're dealing with the day after Juneteenth. From that, 
I know it's pretty heavy. We're going to lie, don't worry. We'll get there. <laughs> From that, because with the darkness, there is no darkness without light. There is no light without darkness. And hopefully we'll travel through that together tonight. I considered, so, and also with that, I also, my great-grandfather, so my grandfather's father was born enslaved. He was a child when, when slavery ended. And, and, I, all, and I, I wonder what happened next. What did he teach his, what did he teach my, his son, my, my grandfather? What did my grandfather teach me? And as a child, there was the, a thing that I, I was really angry at one point in time. And I said, that's not fair. And my mother looked at me and said, life isn't fair. And if you believed on your in freedom from enslavement that you were going to get your 40 acres and a mule, that you were going to get something to help you carry on, and that wasn't happening and it didn't happen, what happens next? And as I traveled around the world and I traveled through this state, I wondered where would I ever find a place that was my home? Because when folks were left out of slavery, they weren't repatriated and they weren't patriated. So where is home? And I landed here by choice. And I love it here. And I love the land. And this poem comes from that. The poem is May I. May I live on this piece of land. If history serves, my life won't be long. I'm not asking to own it, cause all land is free. I would like a place to lay my head, to cast off the chains that have bound and sought to control me. Great granddad never got his 40 acres and a mule. He was set loose, yet never set free. I'm sure he'd like me to collect the debt that is owed, and I know, cause I've been told this land ain't free. What I ask for is what is owed by his legacy surviving to me. May I live on this piece of land. When the people arrived and put stakes in the ground, who did they pay for the land that now is not free? When the people put up fences that contained enslaved people that looked a great deal like me, is that when the land became suddenly not free? May I live on this piece of land. Please, regardless of where I stray or how far I roam, this piece of land keeps calling me, calling me home. The rivers nearby converge. Spring transformation is wrought. This land remains not to be sold, not to be bought, to be lived on, to be loved on. May I live on this piece of land. Please. Put your pen, please, please. The stories I have that come from the work that I do, uh, this work is not work. It is a conjuring. Often I'll sit and the words will come through me and, and I, I have to write them down and then I look at them and there they are. It doesn't take like a tweaking, it just, they come and they, it's almost a song that happens. Um, and each of the things that are happening in the world around us uh, are also a part of this song that I'm writing, these, these poems this work, this practice. Um, the next poem is, It Ain't Safe Yet. Step inside, there is work to be done. Step inside, I said there is work to be done. How black are you? Blue black, true black, and how do you know? When you speak, what words fall out? And how hard do you have to work to lay out the words the world can hear? Are you ready to defend your blackness? Because you're going to have to. There is no pass. Never was one unless you can pass for not being one. Step inside. Your soul ain't ready yet. 
Your heart is too tender and would make a tasty tartare. Your line is not strong enough for you to balance upon as you try to rise above, to hold up, to bring up the ones you love. Your mind is too small. It needs to become a universe. Only then will you truly have a place that is safe. Step inside. Grow yourself, not your ego. So immense your body cannot contain you. Grow your roots so deep that nothing of this world could possibly unearth you. Not one word. That one paragraph, that one document could ever knock you off your center. Grow your mind. That your wisdom shows without the utterance of a word. That your knowledge is attached to every planet of existence, that you know there is no longer anything worth fighting for, that you know the winner of the war still has enemies, that you know peace, that you know peace, that you know peace. Then, and only then, will it be safe to step outside. The next poem I wrote um, a few years ago, and it was a reason for me to turn off the news, to turn off the radio, to turn off the television, uh, because yet another person was senselessly murdered another person with brown skin. And since writing this, there have been many more, and they're in the news. This is before Brianna, this is before Tyree, this is before George, and this came out. We don't know what is inside each of us. We don't know what we fear. And one of the things, when I was 25 years old and I was doing what I loved, traveling the world as a performer, yet that performance meant that I was traveling through cities around the world and around our country. And a statistic I heard when I was 25 is that one in five black men in urban areas will not live to be 35. At the time, the big deal was black on black crime. Um, there was all these, there was a lot of things, and there were a lot of reasons why uh, one in five black men would not live to be 35. And even though I was a performer and I was regaled on stage, every time I walked down the street, I counted heads. Because if I, there was six black men out there, one of us might not live to be 35. That's a lot to carry. And when these murders started coming up, and we have social media where everybody could throw it and repost it and retweet it and send it to you, I was getting inundated with all these things and outrage. And I wanted to put out this notice poetically that my death would not be an accident. The poem is too much to live for. <coughs> if you find my lifeless body hanging from a tree, know that I have too much to live for. I am not a fruit that easily grows on trees, yet too many trees have fruit that looks like me, and too many mamas sobbing hard on their knees, knowing that their baby has so much to live for. Jemima is not my aunt. Ben is not my uncle. 
If you are too busy fighting to keep your belly full that you have no time to fight to keep my lungs full, I have to let you go because I have too much to live for. There is nothing about my blackness that I need to hide, so you best believe if I'm hanging, it was not suicide. So hear what I'm saying, because I say it with pride. I have too much to live for. Back in time, as going through school, uh, this, I went to a public school and every morning, bell would ring, you'd stand up to say the Pledge of Allegiance, and someone would come over the, the speaker system and you'd say the Pledge of Allegiance, and I stood up, my hand on my heart, and said the Pledge of Allegiance, until I was in high school. Um, and yet, every time I said it, something hurt. I had two uncles who were incarcerated from as long as I can remember. And I heard through from the family that they were incarcerated improperly and correctly for something they didn't do. And later it was revealed that they didn't do it. But each of them spent 17 years in prison. Um, and they didn't have a chance to appeal or to fight against that. And that's just one thing. And that was one thing that hit close to home. And then I, there was a woman, a young lady in my high school and I saw her stand up one day and she'd been in my, my class since the third grade but I'd never noticed that she stood up but didn't put her hand on her heart and she didn't say a word. And for religious reasons, she didn't say the Pledge of Allegiance. And at that moment, I realized that I could too. I didn't have to say it. Um, there was a lot of it that resonated with me and there's parts that did not. And when I thought about that, I started digging, what is it that um, am I un-American? What is it that's the problem? And I went back to the Declaration of Independence. And while I was working on this, I, started to, I began to rewrite the Declaration. And this poem is called Declaration. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all humans are not created equal. Some have been created with more, while some have been created with less. Some are rewarded in life, while some are barred from success. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all lives matter, although some matter less. We are all entitled to life, liberty, liberty and the pursuit of happiness, unless it is determined by majority's decision that you are not. The pursuit of happiness is for all until the powers that be decide that rules do not apply to everyone. Yet those rules will apply to everyone in accordance to how they react to the sun. Life is only fair if you are fair. In all fairness, you will fare less if you lack fairness. So great is the sin to lack fairness of skin that all rules must be laid by, by show of darkness. You must be prepared to accept less. So be it known that only some were created in the image of God, and you know who you are. After all, why should God create your defective bod? We hold these truths to be self-evident. In God we trust. I do a lot of reading, and I do a lot of listening to audiobooks. Uh, and there was a, a, I don't know if you heard of Reverend Ike. He was a evangelical uh, preacher. And he said something that really offended a lot of people. Uh, someone was trying to knock him down, and they said to him, you think you are God. And Reverend Mike's return was, oh no, God thinks he is me. And the first time I heard that, I was like, huh, wow, that guy was really cocky. And then I thought, wow, wait a minute. We are, if we are all created in that image, then why not? And so this came from that. 
and it's a really short one. I am created in the image of God. Therefore, when God looks in the mirror, it is my image that is reflected. I have no delusion of grandeur. God has no delusion of insignificance. That one makes me laugh. Uh, and, and the idea of it, of like, oh, when I, the whole idea, of if, if you're familiar with Namaste, I, what I recognize in each of you, and standing in the room with you, stand while seeing you on the street when we make eye contact, that is the spark that, yeah, I see the God in you, whether you call it God or spirit or energy, whatever that is, I see that in you. And I love that in you. All the poems I write are not very deep. Some of them are. Um, and some of them are about that, that energy, seeing the God in things. And this next poem is just being aware of that energy, that life force, that love force. Um, it's called the breeze. Winds blow, carrying bird song, grasshopper, cricket, cicada symphonette, sun's rays illuminate, fingers of divinity casting forth, eyes closed, revealing the unseeable, awakening <coughs> senses, far too long asleep. Clarity of vision, concealing the known, revealing the unknown. Eyes open, winds blow, all becomes visible, except what is expected. My next poem comes with a warning. It uses the N-word quite judiciously. Uh, and the reason for this, I had watched the documentary on James Baldwin. And I grew up with a button. And that button was the N-word. If you said the N-word around me, I would go ballistic. I'd want to kill. And I realized that if that was my button and anyone could push it, I was not in control. And when I listened to James Baldwin, when I heard what he had to say, it really resonated with me. And his use of the N-word, and, and many rappers will use the N-word, and they say it, it, it takes away its power. I don't believe it does, because the only reason it was ever created was out of fear, to cause pain and hurt, and if I were to take a knife and stab myself with it, it would hurt. If I did it repeatedly, I might get used to it. Doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. It just means I've gotten used to it, and there's no need for that. What I did was changed what my relationship to that word was. And part of that was writing this poem. And as I wrote it, I thought, oh my God. Like every time I said it, it was like vomiting. And every time I wrote it, it was like vomiting. And here it is. The poem is, I am not your nigger. I am not your nigger. Nigger, nigger, nigger. Nigger only exists in your mind. When, you, when your mind fractured into believing there is white and there is other, when you embraced white and had no conceivable use for the other, the nigger was born, and born only in your mind. The white side of your mind decided it should cleave the shadow side of your mind and send it packing, yet the shadow still remained. 
Your mind is in, in its inability to do anything, thrusts the cleaving to the body. Very soon after cleaving started, you realized it was not self-sustaining to cleave oneself, and much easier to cleave others. So the nigger side of your mind leapt through your mind to someone in conleavable proximity. Let it be clear, the nigger is your mind's baby. And all the while, smugly in the shadow of your mind, safely sits your nigger, your nigger mind baby, smiling. The injustice of it all. For every nigger you kill in the world, one will always live on in your mind. Nigger. So know that you can't remove from the world what only lives in your mind. In essence, you are what is of your mind. Therefore, you are what you know you are. And the reason I use the N-word, I am not your nigger. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. <laughs> hmm. Black and white. I'll just keep going. The next poem is called Where. Where does my blackness end and I begin? I may know the answer, but do you? My blackness is the price the Republic places on my person, and I know my value is to be much more. Eyes wide open, I can see there is a curse upon us. Eyes shut fast, I can see there is a curse upon us all. Raise your hand as high as you can reach is it a black hand you raised? Or is it a white hand? Look upon the person next to you on your right. Look upon the person next to you on your left. Are they black or are they white? What is their value? What is their worth? Are they worth more than you or less? With each question asked, where does your comfort end? For this person's life, how much would you spend? There is a curse upon us. Until you stop being white and I stop being black, there is this curse upon us will have no end. That poem, there was a point in which I, I well, growing up, the check boxes I've checked have been African American, Afro American, Negro, Negro, Negroid, Black, and there's probably a couple more. And there was a point where I went, why do I have to keep checking these different boxes? Why does someone else keep saying who I am? Why do I have to fall into that box? And when I chose black, it wasn't because I chose um, my ethnicity. Black is a culture. What I chose was when I heard, uh, I can't even remember who it was, someone spoke about black and that black in pigment is the combination of all things, putting all those pigments together. And that Blackness is inclusive, and that any one of us can choose to be black, and that's when I chose to be black. And of recent, I say that I am the brown skin descendant of enslaved Africans, and that also is limiting, because I am more than that as well. Yet, I still hold on to that blackness because I love you. I love you. I love that we are, that we make up me, that we are one, that there is no difference. And I don't see that there's a white and a black. I see that there's all of us mixed together in so many different ways. And that is the beauty of blackness. The next poem is Black is Love. Standing with my brothers and sisters, finally home, healing 
in process, remembering self, remembering soul, loving with my brothers and sisters, united in individuality, connected by love, understanding the universe within. No matter what is added, the blackness remains. No matter how much is taken away, the blackness remains. Here we stand, here we sit, in the glory of blackness, in love. And I will bring it to a close with one more poem. Uh, and I keep mentioning each of us, because you are in these words. You are in what is conjured and created because you are in this community. And this community wouldn't be without that tail end of unity. And our connectedness creates that unity, creates the life, creates the life force that, that helps manifest and conjure art, the practice of creation. And this next poem is the answer to my other poem, Declaration. And I'm going to need your help. It is the Declaration of Interconnectedness, <laughs> which is also the answer or a response or reprise to the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> Uh, and so, if you'll please help me, I will say, when I say I declare that, will you please respond, we are one. Okay. Let's practice it. I declare that. We are, we are one. Let's practice it again. I declare that. We are one. I declare that. We are one. Every father's daughter and every mother's son, I declare that. We are one. We are all human. There is no race, so why must I run? I declare that. We are one. We need to restore the joy to living, because Hayden's playing with a loaded gun. I declare that. We are one. Until this mantra flows from every mouth, there is work to be done. I declare that. We are one. Rise up, rise up, look around. Brother to sister to sister to brother to auntie and uncle to cousin. We must value one another. Another. It must be repeated. I declare. We are one. Uh, it must be repeated. I declare that. We are it one. must be sung. I declare that. We are one. Until it rings throughout the world like church bells rung. I declare that. We are one. Emancipate your mind. Let's pa let past hurts be undone. As the mountains grow and the rivers run. I declare that. We are I one. declare that. We are I one. declare that. We are one. Thank you. Thank you for going on this ride with me. I would love to share with you the other things that are happening in my creative process. Uh, one of those is I do have a podcast that's out there on many podcast platforms, wherever you download your podcast from. It's called the Philosophy 101 Podcast from that other name. That I have. Philosophy 101. Um, I also am working in the community in the schools currently with uh, my partner, Scott Kaltenball, um, doing mentoring and coaching. Um, in the elementary schools right now, we're working with healthy masculinity. Um, with our, we're inspiring uh, some of our youngsters. Um, just, we felt that there's a need, and the schools have also felt that there was a need. So we go in and we we have conversations and we talk about what that what that is. And it's not about giving hard, fast directions. It's about opening up their resources for learning, for growing and for gaining ways, healthy pathways, as they mature. And I also do personal coaching. If you go to my, my site, my, I have a, my website is, I forget what it is now, it's brand new, imjelly.com, imjelly.com, T-J-E-L-I. And um, 
are there any questions that you have um, for me about the process, about the works, about the content? This would be a time for that. Yes? Are there books available here that we could purchase? Oh, they're on the way. <laughs> yeah, I ordered them way later than I thought because of the amount of books that I needed to order. Um, if you would like to purchase a book and have it autographed, you, I have a, actually a QR code that you can order your book by clicking on that QR code and clicking on buy a book. And it will give you all the information to buy the book and I will get it to you. Um, and that's for this book, the day after Juneteenth. <coughs> All of my books are available through Amazon as well. So if you go to Amazon, my author page is William Fortune still. My name changes, my legal name change is still underway. Um, so still everything's under William Fortune through Amazon. And I have the day after Juneteenth, um, a poem a day. Sacred and Sacrosanct, which is also a, book, a collection of poems, and Philosophy, which was my book of memoir. Yes? Jolly. No, Jelly. Jelly. You'll have to forgive me. I remember you from you know many me. days. Yes. So uh, I'll, uh, before I ask the question, I'll, uh, I'll do what you inspired me to do. Which is, you said namaste, right? Namaste. All I know is I read somewhere it says, uh, I bow to that which is highest in you. Mm. And so that's what I learned somewhere along the way. So I know you as a performer, mm -hmm. and you're obviously also a writer. I want to go back to the beginning. What was it? <clears throat> when was the first writing? The publishing? Like how? Like do you, do you remember? Were you like, I have to put this down on paper and I have to share it. Like can you share that part, the, the jumping into writing? Because a lot of us, yeah. I know a lot of people around here write, but some people don't write. And I don't know how to, what started you? How did you get the first thoughts on paper? That's the, one of the scariest questions I've oh, ever been is. asked. <laughs> and the reason why is I grew up and I struggled through school. I had, it wasn't dyslexia, it was something else. So I would get motion sickness from reading. I wasn't a reader until I was in my mid-twenties. And the first book I ever read was Jurassic Park. Um, I, you would, you know, you remember that, that moment. I remember that moment because I made it through a book without getting dizzy, without feeling nauseous, uh, and something started to shift. So I, didn't, I wasn't a book person. I wasn't that person who read a lot of books and had all these, the knowledge of authors. And, I didn't, and But once I started to read, I have read voraciously since then. Uh, and because of starting to read in my 20s, I never considered being a writer. And I used to write, I, like, I loved to hear Dr. Seuss, I loved the play on words and the rhymes and nonsensical words. And so I used to write these things. Even when I was in, when I couldn't read, I would write nonsensical words and rhyme them. And then later, as I started to write more, that started to come out. And I do have a whole lot of nonsensical stuff that I've written. Uh, and then I, I worked with um, Suzanne Kingsbury years back to write when I wrote my memoir. Uh, and she, as a writing coach, was so helpful for me. Uh, she has the gateless writing technique, and gateless writing is about removing the obstacles. So she just encouraged me to write. And I, after, when I started working with her, I started waking up at 5.30 in the morning, and I would write for an hour every morning. And writer's block, if there is no such thing as writer's block. Um, writer's block happens when the editor and the writer try to show up at the same time. And so you're going, oh no, oh yeah. And so what she encouraged me to do, if, you, if, if you're having a conversation with the editor up there, write the conversation down. So I started, I am having difficulty writing because this doesn't feel like it's okay. And oh, the floodgates opened and I started writing. And I have encouraged anyone who has a block, whether it's a musician, uh, an athlete, um, to ask the question, is the athlete showing up or is the coach showing up? Is the writer showing up or is the editor showing up? Is the musician showing up or is the <laughs> band director showing up? And most of the times it's because they're showing up uh, partitioned or broken. And when I show up to write, it's time to write. And 
I carry this journal with me everywhere. It is full of the stuff. Thank you. Would you tell us a story, please, about offering your gifts to young people? Some stories. <laughs> offering my gifts to some to young people. Wow. Uh, well, the showing up. So if you didn't hear, can, will I tell a story about offering my gifts to young people? Currently, I'm working with the, one of the other groups I'm working with beyond my own in, in the, elementary, or the elementary schools in town is with the Vermont Wilderness School. And I am a mentor one day a week. Uh, and that also was a little rough to show up for because I didn't believe I belonged as a wilderness mentor. If you were to look at the pamphlets and the brochures for wilderness mentoring or wilderness schools, you're not going to find me in many photos. Uh, and so I thought, well, I don't belong here. Now, once again, backing up, my mother ran a summer camp. And it was an uh, arts, nature camp. I grew up learning about eating off the land. I grew up walking through forests, uh, being drugged to find that lady slipper plant that would lived in a certain area because of the way the, the, the water flowed. And this was part of me, but it, my mother wasn't teaching us. She was, we were living it. And when I started doing, then showing up for, at the Vermont Wilderness School, I still didn't believe I belonged there. And on my first day and sharing just observations that I had from, from and my, my latest teacher is the birch tree. The white birch tree has been teaching me almost every day. And so sharing some of the teachings of the birch, and now the kids laugh at me when I say, oh, this is something that the birch taught, taught me. And uh, okay, and I'll, but they're, they're getting it. And they're like, okay, what's this birch's name? Like, uh, you wouldn't understand if I said it. <laughs> um, but they have, there's so much that, I'm, that I learned from that. And to be able to show up is one of the most important things. And how much we teach, the teaching is, I'm going to show up and I'm going to be comfortable here. And when I show up and I'm comfortable in that space, it allows those kids to show up and be comfortable in that space. And they don't have to think, oh, I'm going to be a forester or I'm going to be a this. I'm going to be here in the forest and I'm going to learn and I'm going to listen and I'm going to watch and I'm going to allow it to teach. And there are these adults who have been here before me and maybe I'll ask some questions and maybe they'll offer some resources. And so that's the story of, of mentoring young folks. Yes? I'm, I'm wondering, um, let's see, I guess I'm most familiar with you from your circus life. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering about the connection between that life and your life as a writer and how that life may have informed, I don't know, that, that which seems like a wonderful, huge part of your life. And now you have a different kind of a life maybe and how they may or may not so I see what you're doing here. You're trying to corral me down that path to talk about how I got from circus to being a writer. <laughs> uh, and I don't know. Uh, and it is an important part of my life. There is, I mean, we all, every one of us has gone through different phases in life. Um, you know, we've got, we're, we're not children anymore. Some of us aren't young adults. Some of us aren't middle age anymore. Uh, so, you know, and so. There was a part of me, so in order for this to be, for me to be here, there was a part of me that had to die. And that circus performer, that acrobat, who traveled the world, flipped and tumbled, held four people on his shoulders, would catch people flying 35 feet in the air with his bare hands, uh, that person lived powerfully enough to step aside and allow the body to sit down and rest and the mind to open up, stand up, speak up, and show up.
And I did love that part of my life. It was really hard to let go. Yes? I don't know. This is just a funny question, but what made you choose Brattleboro if you've been everywhere? Can somebody lob me a softball, please? <laughs> <laughs> What made me choose Brattleboro? So I moved here because of my former wife. Her family was in the area. We wanted to be near of one of our families, and this was it. I grew up in South Jersey, a place called Hamilton, um, which is on the edge of the Pine Barrens. And it had changed a, a lot. There's still agricultural area, but it had changed, and there was a, just around was a lot more bustling, and I wanted similar to what I grew up with, to be able to tell my kids, go outside, yeah. go outside. And this was a place where um, I could see that happening. And in that poem, May I, that's about living here. Um, when I say the rivers converged, it's about the West River and, and the Connecticut converging, and it's about the Rock River converging into the West River. It's about here. Um, there's something about here that has called me here. and. Uh, whether it's on Governor's Mountain or Owl's Head Mountain in Guilford, or, you know, there are mountains that call me to their valleys, to their peaks, and when I sit there, when I stand there, when I walk there, something about the earth moves in me. And when I divorced and could have chosen to move back, my mother had just passed away, moved back to New Jersey into her house, it wasn't an option. This is home. And I feel like it's called me here for a long period of time. Yes. Any more questions? Well, I, I just want to say. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say we're so glad you're home. Mm -hmm. And oh. you're sure, home mm -hmm. with us. Another wonderful evening. Thank you to the Friends of the Library who sponsored this program. And thank you all for coming out. And make sure that you sign up for our newsletter so you know all the good things that are coming this way. Because you'll want to come back soon. We've got some really good programs coming up. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you all. Thank you.